Well, hello, welcome once again to Pale Blooms and Beyond. Thank you for joining us today. Philip Wright is an English musician most known as the lead singer and drummer for pop rock band Paper Lace. The band had a couple of big hits during the 1970s, Billy Don't Be a Hero and The Night Chicago Died. The lineup during their heyday was Philip, lead vocals, drums, Mick Vaughn, lead and rhythm guitar, Cliff Fish, bass, Chris Morris, guitar vocals, and Carlo Santana, guitar, mandolin, and vocals. That's not the American guitarist Carlos Santana. It's Carlo. Okay. Through, through lineup changes, the band released a couple of albums and several singles before originally calling it a day in 1984. But then in 2009, founding members Philip and Cliff reformed the band, now called the original 70s Paper Lace, with Phil Hendricks, vocals and guitar, and Dave Major, keyboards and vocals. Sadly, Cliff lost a two-year battle with cancer last year. The band decided to soldier on with new bassist Dale Corcoran. So as it stands, Philip is the only original member. Recently, the band has played to sell out shows on tour in New Zealand and Australia, and there will be some upcoming gigs in the UK. So hopefully my guests can provide some more info and insight on these upcoming shows. Yeah. Well, welcome, Philip. Nice to be here. Thank you. And then uh, apologies again for the technical difficulties on my end. Okay. <laughs> and hopefully hopefully the, we'll go smooth sailing the rest of the way. Well, um, take us back to the beginning. Um, you were born in Nottingham, right? That's right. Okay. Okay. So home, hometown boy makes good. <laughs> <laughs> That's what well, I said, yeah. Yeah. Well, do you have any uh, fond childhood memories growing up there? Um, no, it's, it's just a, a normal sort of Midland town. Um, famous for, uh, famous, it's the center of the lace industry, or was in back in the day. And, and people sort of associate us with Nottingham because of that. Yeah, yeah. And that's where the, the name came from, right? Paper Lace? Well, it what? didn't, no. Oh, okay. It turned out that, um, that, that the Nottingham thing fitted really well. But we were we were looking for a new name in the uh, early 1970. And uh, one of the guys was, was looking for a, a book of things to make. Uh, ah. And uh, the... the uh, sort of pastime of folding paper and tearing bits out of it and then yeah. opening it out into a doily. Um, oh, okay. The, he said, there you go, paper lace. And, and we, we all sort of looked at one another and said, well, that's not a bad name. And and it, and it fits with the Nottingham thing. Right. So that, the rest is history. Right, right. Okay. All right. Uh, well, uh, early on, do you remember hearing uh, music in the household? Yeah, I mean, my dad actually was a bit of a drummer, um, very sort of weekends um, in, a, in a pub with a pianist. Ah, okay. Uh, and he used to uh, he used to go to the pub at weekends and, and play, and he brought the kit home once, um, very old fashioned kit, big bass drum, uh, skulls on the top, and uh, cymbal and a snare drum. I can remember, uh, and he brought it home basically to to uh, refurbish it, and uh, and and he painted it, and it was uh, um, I remember it had calf skin skins on it, and um, I, I must have taken something in or something. That was that was when I was God, I, I, could, I must have been seven or eight. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I was at school in my uh, sort of senior school, if you like, at the age of, well, I just I just joined uh, a secondary school <clears throat> and um, I was 13. And there was a guy in the class who looked like Hank Marvin. And, oh. um, and at the time, <laughs> that, they were the only band, if you like, guitar band that were that was around. Uh, and so we uh, we got together. And there was another guy who played sort of rhythm guitar, uh, Brian. This uh, Hank lookalike. He he bought um, he bought a Fender 
Stratocaster um, really early on. I think he's still got it, and it must be worth it. Must be worth a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> but he he doesn't play anymore. Um, but I'm still in touch with him. And um, unfortunately, the other guy died uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we all went to his funeral. But um, but yeah, that was me. That was me at thirteen. Um, Tip tapping with cutlery on a table, <laughs> and then my mum. Uh, took pity on me and uh, bought me <laughs> my first drum kit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Pete, Pete tells the story of uh, playing with, you know, learning with brushes, you know, doing the, like the jazzy type of drumming. Yeah, yeah. And his his parents said, yes, more of that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not as loud, you know. No, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and a, a, a lot of parents would either tell their kids to go in the basement or outside or whatever to, yeah. to play drum, drums. Or burn the kit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's uh, exactly. Yeah. Oh god. Well, um how about uh can you recall one of the first singles or albums that you that you bought? Uh yeah, I bought a single. The, the first single I bought was uh a, a song called When by the Kaylin Twins. Is that right? Yeah. Is that right? That's the first single I bought. Do you know, I have another channel, a uh, YouTube channel, where I post songs from various, you know, just artists. Yeah. Uh, and, okay. No, I posted a different song. Oh, right. I posted it. Yeah. Um, it was uh, Trouble oh, was, right. was one. And I don't know if that was a single or not. But after uh, this, that's so cool. After this uh, is over, I can send you the link to my my other channel yeah do and that. you can and you can listen to that you can listen to that it's, it's yeah, a nice I, haven't, I haven't got the copies <laughs> <laughs> right still you I, mean, got I mean that must have been cracking. <laughs> that was when that was when records were were uh, well in in new money they were 12 and a half p right yeah in new yeah. money that, right. they were very cheap that was it was before they went to or well, well, double that sort of. Uh, I mean, in English money, then it was five shillings. Okay, right. Yes, exactly. And uh, yeah. you know that that uh, that was my first. I think the second record I bought was um, "It'll Be Me," Cliff Richard. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. It just the, uh... in his rock and roll uh, era. Oh. Right, right. You know, uh, back by the shadows. Were, was he? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, ex well, you had the shadows. We had the ventures. Yeah, so, that's right. yeah, yeah. That was uh, a lot of a lot of uh, found out influenced by you know, those guitar bands. Okay, yeah, well, well, let's. Uh, I was going to ask you about uh, some of the other maybe musicians and artists that you were into uh, early on or as a teenager. Yeah, well, as I say, the shadows, and then then the Beatles came along and just overtook everything. Yeah. Um, I, 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 well, Cliff and myself, we were both big Beatles fans, and I hadn't met I hadn't met him then, but we talked about it later on, uh, and he felt that exactly the same way that he we used to he used to wait for the the next single coming out, you know, and, and just rush out and buy it, and, oh. and just. The Beatles were were well. It was just they were just phenomenal. I, I just uh, I still really think that they're the best best band ever. You know, yeah. for for a guitar vocal band, just yeah. amazing. Yes, they were. Yes, and you know, as they as they matured, you know, each each album was different, and uh, yeah, that's you know, right. They, they just kept staying on the cusp of the of the music scene. I think you know, in the forefront. Well. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm still a big fan of Paul McCartney, anyway. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I think I think we all are. Yeah, he's he's, he's still looking pretty good. You know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and he still care. still sounds pretty good. But, you know, yeah. when he when he gets the chance to uh, when he gets the chance to tour, his yeah. his voice becomes more and more um, worked, if you like. And he, yeah. he but he needs that. It must be very difficult for somebody uh, like him to just sort of turn it on. You know, a lot of people said, oh, he's, he ought to pack in because his voice is bad and this, that and the other. But 
but you know of of an age i think the stuff that the stuff that uh, uh artists uh bygone age where where they had fame so in in back in the day they yep. they sing their new stuff and their voice is fine with that but but to go back and sing the stuff that you started with it's very difficult because of key keys and all the rest of it you know you your your voice i mean i'm i'm blessed i don't uh, I, I sing everything in the same key that uh, we recorded it back in 74 and, and, right. and before that right and i've heard i've heard people say that too comments on that that your voice sounds almost exactly the same yeah uh, as as before yeah it's it, you know different people they're voices do change and well he's taking good care of himself you know yeah uh, absolutely. at least at least it seems to he seems yeah. to be well how about uh the first live show that you that you attended live gig that you went to oh dear I think <laughs> the first live gig i went to i went to see uh cream oh oh that must <laughs> that must have been something uh, in, a sm in a small basement club in nottingham uh -huh. wow. it was amazing they put on a great show i imagine oh yeah and it but wow. it was it was very intimate i mean there was only probably there was probably only about 150 people in there really it was very intimate very sort of uh and it was so so loud <laughs> yeah i was, <laughs> was going to say yeah. Just, but the sound bouncing off the walls and yeah. didn't hear your, yourself think i imagine but, was, <laughs> wow. but, but nobody was doing that sort of material it was just yeah uh, yeah quite it, amazing exactly did you have ever had a chance to see hendrix no i didn't yeah I didn't at all yeah, um i admired him you know but but uh i mean the only thing that the, the nearest thing i got to watching hendrix was uh was uh probably woodstock okay you know, right and that came right. yeah well uh what was the the first band that you were uh, a part of? We were called. What were we called? We were called the first band that I when I was when I was at school mm -hmm. uh, before I left school. It, it was a band called the Midbeats. Okay. Um, because we we sort of did middle of the road stuff, and uh, we called ourselves the Midbeats. Yeah, <laughs> we used to do a few shadows numbers. I didn't sing at that at that point at all. Um, we had a, a separate singer, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it was very strange. <laughs> and then, then we moved on. We changed. We changed. And did we change our name? No, I think we were we were still the Midbeats until that just it just folded. Um, yeah. I took. Um, I started working life as a um, a toolmaker apprentice. Okay. Uh, and I did a five year apprenticeship. Um, starting when I was sort of 16. Um, and I came out of my time when I was 21. Okay. I got married at that point, um, went professional, and, uh, yeah, joined a, a band called Music Box. Music Box, yeah. yeah. That actually morphed into Paper Lace. Right, right. Yeah, I've, I've heard a little bit of the material from Music Box. and. Uh, right. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I, I like I like what I heard. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, yeah, very very interesting. When did you uh, actually start start singing? Then I started singing uh, to the tail end of uh, tail end of the mid beats. Okay. Um, and the first song I sang was uh, a Beatles song. It was "And I Love Her." Yeah, oh, I love that one. Yeah. <laughs> And it was it was a, a you know keep it quiet and all the rest of it and I didn't have to play play much drums and then uh, and then it was the lack of a, a front man and a, the lack of a a, a a good singer that that sort of I I started to sing more and do more and it was strange I don't know where I, don't, I, I class myself as a singing drummer rather than a <laughs> singer. <Drumming> singer. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one thing that's that's always fascinated me about a singer playing another instrument at the same time is to be able to concentrate on both. Yeah. You know, you know, that must be, you know, take some some getting used to and some 
uh, work. Yeah. Yeah. But it, but it's when you've been doing it, I suppose, as long as I have, you know, it, it it's, it's, it's second nature. There yeah. are, there are songs that I can't sing, uh, but it's all to do with timing. Right. 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 Well, so uh, as you mentioned, Music Box uh, became Paper Lace in uh, 69, I believe. Uh, can you really recall any of your uh, early gigs or shows? Um, yeah, we, we 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 played we played pubs basically when when I started. It was just pubs, and then it got into uh, when we when we got to the sort of professional stage um, in '69 when I went professional. Um, it was it was sort of working men's clubs. And it was a very much a, a sort of cabaret type scene, if you like. Then um, there was no, there was no arenas. Not that we were capable of playing arenas, but uh, there was no big, huge gigs that you could play. Right, right. Well, did you uh, did you go down pretty well though? Uh, yeah, I mean, the... it, that's where you. It, it was that was another, if you like another apprenticeship because you learn how to read a crowd and know what they want to hear and all the rest of it because at that time we were we were doing a lot of covers and we were doing our own arrangements of of different songs um because the guy the guy at the time um that was in music box uh, he there was a keyboard player and he did used to do all the harmony arrange, arrangements Oh, okay. And he, some of them were very involved, and uh, because we'd all got the the sort of harmony bug, if you like, um, yeah. and uh, yeah, we we would do we we'd do Beach Boys, Four Seasons, that sort of thing, Association, um, yeah, Simon and Garfunkel, you know, it was anything with with a harmony sort of feel. Yeah, yeah. Well, but those are all some great bands there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, well, uh, let's let's move forward to uh, the first album uh, with Paper Lace, first edition, yeah, uh, nineteen seventy two. Yeah, um, I tend to listening to the album. I tend to like the first side of that yeah. album. Um, In the morning, yeah, uh, great track. And you mentioned the harmonies, great, yeah, big, great big, biggie song. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. uh huh, exactly, <laughs> and a uh, very nice harmonies on that one um lady is is a is a is another nice nice track yeah. that was that was written by roy white he, he was the keyboard player okay the arranger that i referred to earlier yeah okay okay all right yeah i appreciate your comments or any recollections and uh, inspiration or behind the songs that kind of thing uh and then i've got you that's enough for me yeah uh pretty bubblegum kind of kind of pop yeah, but uh, to me that seemed like that it was a B side of a single, I believe. Uh, yeah. Surprised, surprised it wasn't an A side. Um, mm -hmm. That th that just has a you know single to me written all over it. That yeah, <laughs> that track really really well done, well done. Um, and then uh, threw my love away. Yeah, and these are all these are all in the first side yeah, of yeah. the album. Um, and I love the piano in in that one. Well, it's, uh, it was um, Martha. Whatever happened was that on that album? Uh yes, yes. Yeah, well, we still do that on stage. We do that oh. in the live set. Okay, maybe that was the single. Maybe that was it the. Was, it, it, uh, it was a. I think it was a B side. Oh, it was also okay. Yeah, okay. because I, we I, had I, a we had a single in seventy three uh, mm -hmm. called Ragamuffin Man. Right, right. Which, which was a. a a cover of the hit that Man from Man had in yeah. uh, in '69. Yes, you're right. Yes, and on the B side was Martha. That was on the B side of that one. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Well, uh, you know, not a bad album. You know, not not bad at all. Um, no. Now, for those viewers not familiar uh, with the show Opportunity Knox, uh, explain explain the show and uh, how you uh, entered the competition. Yeah, well, in 1970, we took an audition for uh, for a, a talent com competition, a TV talent competition, uh, much like the uh, 
the sort of Britain's got talent or America's got talent, whatever, that sort of thing. But it wasn't a, bear in mind, there's no internet, there's no computers, nothing like that. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to vote for someone, you had to put pen to paper in an envelope, stamp, post, post the vote. And, yeah. uh, and we used to get thousands of votes uh -huh. um, because Opportunity Knots was a really popular programme. Um, when it when when it came along, and we uh, we we we, as I said, we we'd had a, a couple of releases records, but in 1970, when uh, when um, we got we got this audition to to do it, we we thought, oh well, we'll, we'll go on there, you know, we we'll see what see what we can do, uh, and the, there was a like a panel of uh, judges, um, two or three people, but there were. Uh, the the master of ceremonies on the TV program was a guy called Huey Green, okay, um, and he wasn't there. He'd sent he'd sent his producer there and another talent scout. Um, so it wasn't a formal like the like the judging panel on the the uh, TV programs of today. Um, it was a very sort of. Uh, down down to the workers, if you like, the people uh, back back. In the in the in the sort of uh, backside of the the uh, TV, okay. um, not not the front front of camera people, and um, and they picked and spotted the talent, if you like, and we were, we went on and we were suited and booted and we we did a it was in a the audition was in a huge hotel in uh, in Nottingham, um, it's. It's been converted since into apartments, but uh, but this hotel was a big hotel, and there was about a thousand people there, ready for auditions. I mean, it was a big chance for for, yeah. for fortune, if you like, um, yeah. because everybody everybody knew about the program, um, and it was uh, it was publicised quite in the in the local papers and all the rest of it. So we went along and we did this audition. And we, we we did a couple of songs, and they said, "Can you do something else?" And we did a couple more, and they asked for some more. And we were we we did about sort of twenty twenty five minutes of songs, if you like. Uh, and um, one or two of the other people were looking at one another, saying, "Is this a bit of a fix?" You know, because they seem to <laughs> they seem to like this band, uh, but it wasn't. It was just that we we fitted TV at that time, and. Um, they said, "Well, we'd like to see you on the show. We'll, we'll be in touch." And we mm -hmm. thought, "Oh, right, we'll 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 be on there in a couple of months." And in actual fact, we had to wait three years before wow. <clears throat> before what? we were we were written to <clears throat> and uh, said, you know, report to uh, this studio in Teddington Lock, I think it was in uh, London, the outskirts of London, um, uh, to be on the show. Yeah. Um, you <laughs> had to. Had you guys, let me ask you, had you guys kind of given up on the idea by then? Three years? Well, yeah. I mean, we, we'd, yeah. We'd, we'd sort of done, we'd done one or two uh, records and we thought, do we really need to be in a talent competition at this point in our career? And then we looked at, we looked at the viewing figures. <laughs> and, and at that time, Opportunity Knox had got a viewing uh, audience of about 7 million. And, oh. uh, and we thought, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've got to be on that show. <laughs> yeah, no contest. Yeah, we just, yeah. Uh, we just appeared on it. We we uh, chatted up a uh, a local uh, politician um, uh -huh. who I was very friendly with, um, and he introduced us to Yui Green. Uh, and he, he was basically like a sponsor. And he mm -hmm. told he told Yui Green about the band that he'd been to see us, um, uh, but he was he was a, a good orator. So okay. and that's what we wanted. We want to make an impression on that side of it as well. So yeah. what what happened was that that you and Green would sit down with your sponsor and chat, and that would be the you know the five or ten minutes talk about the band, and then he'd say, uh, oh, "And here they are, uh, Paper Lace." And, uh -huh. uh, but it was a at that point that was the 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 band that appeared on Opportunity Knocks was the band that made the hit records wow. so and the band that did the audition was totally different it was, oh. a, five, it was a five piece and that, there was only cliff and myself that were in still in that band still in that band 
Yeah. Well, well uh, you and you guys won. You guys yeah. won in that round. Two, two right. three, maybe four times, I think. So we became a household name because you're if you're you're appearing uh what, what used to happen was you they'd count all the votes uh and uh if 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 it surpassed everybody that was on the the, the next week's um contestants if you like so the the winner from the first week would go on to the second week and then there'd be new contestants around them and and if you won that one then you'd go on to the next one and so on and so on and um and it was it, you know, we were we were appealing to seven million people each time, so it was, yeah. and, and they got a a blast of paper lace and what we could do. Um, we were we were a very very close harmony um, band at that time. Um, we 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 were working quite heavily, um, so we became very tight, and and the harmonies were really good. Uh, we did a. We did a, um, I think the first time we won it, we did a uh, a song called, well, it was a tune. There was no actual lyrics in it. It was just voices making noises, basically. And it was a, a song called uh, uh, A Touch of Velvet, A Sting of Brass. Okay. And it was a, it was a, by a French ensemble. Um, and Dave Lee Travis in, in um, one of the DJs, in London, uh, on the radio, he used to use it as a, a signature tune. Oh, really? But okay. after we'd actually we'd actually done the the thing on the on the TV, and wow. people thought, "Oh, this is amazing!" It's a, it was just a great great tune. I don't know whether you've heard a copy of it. No, I haven't. No. A touch of velvet, a sting of brass. Okay. And I, I can't remember who was. I'll look that up. Yeah. It should be on YouTube or. Uh, yeah, I would think so. I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, he keep, starts keep, off with a. He starts off with the harpsichord. Okay. Oh, I love. I love the harpsichord. Hmm. Oh, I, I, will, I will like that song, man. Already, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> well, can you can you remember uh, what bands you beat out in that in that competition? Um, well, there weren't there weren't necessarily bands. Um, oh, okay. Or singers and artists. Yeah. Jugglers, you know. So oh, there, okay. All kinds of a real variety, variety oh. talent. Yeah, variety show. Okay, these are people with uh, dogs that could balance a ball on their nose. You know anything? Uh, okay, all and, right. Okay. And, and the fi the final when when we lost, it was an outside broadcast in Sheffield uh, mm -hmm. because they used to do that occasionally, but they did it on this occasion about four or five weeks in, and um, <clears throat> there was a guy who was a sort of crossover opera singer um uh, and he his name was vincent zara i remember his name <laughs> <laughs> his name was vincent zara and he sang what did he sing he sang some well-known uh opera piece and uh wiped the floor with us <laughs> oh did he <laughs> it was just, yeah it's just the votes came in and that was it he was the he was the sort of the favorite, <laughs> but, but it, it, it did uh, serve its purpose. Yeah, because... yeah. I was going to say that was invaluable exposure for you guys, reaching oh, yeah. that many millions of people like that. You no, know? yeah, and that was that was seventy in seventy three. Yeah, and yeah. In actual fact, um, the writers of, of Billy Don't Be a Hero. Yeah. Um, well, w w one of the uh, wives of. Uh, Peter Callender, who, who was the lyricist, yeah, she was a big fan of Octant in Ox, and she saw us on the program. Uh -huh. and, um, she said, uh, "I know you've you've written this song. You've written this song. Don't know what it's called, um, but but instead of giving it to an established artist, why don't you launch these guys? You know, so the young young guys launch their career if you like." And uh, our well, they got in touch with our management at the time and um, invited us down for a meet and uh, we, yeah. they, they played the, the tune to us and uh, we all sort of thought, yeah, and, and Mitch is a very funny guy. He uh, <laughs> he said, I've got all these ideas. I've got some, there's going to be some drumming on the beginning. We're going to have whistling a whistling intro. 
and we were sort of, I wonder what this is going to turn out like. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just, uh, we, we recorded it in a studio in Clapham, uh, Majestic Studios in Clapham. And uh, it it was it was just a lot of fun doing it and uh, put putting all these things on and having this because it's a it's an anti war song in actual fact yes uh, yes a lot of your country a lot of your yeah. country sort of still yeah. get in touch with it and they all relate it to Vietnam and whatever right. it's it, but right. it was but about the American Civil War I think that was it exactly I was going to say it is well yeah I was just coming to that. It, um, you beat me to the punch, uh, <laughs> Mitch. Mitch Murray and Peter Callender. They saw yeah. you on that sh on the show, yeah. And then th they wrote both of your big hits, yeah. Um, you know what? I always, whenever I see Mitch Murray, I always get it confused with M Mitch Miller, right? Do you, you know who Mitch Miller, the the American yeah. sing along yeah. with Mitch, sing along, yeah. With yeah. That. yeah. So I, every time you know, I think of him instead of Mitch Murray. <laughs> so I always well. I mean, they're both last names start with M too. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, oh, let me. And speaking of getting confused, uh, did uh, do you have any stories about uh, Carlo Santana getting confused, mixed up with Carlos? Did he ever get mixed up with Carlos Santana? Um, I don't. I don't know. I, I, I yeah. don't recall any any sort of anecdotes yeah. about that. But the the thing was Carlo. He, he was an addition um, to the band because uh, it was a management decision that we we weren't totally in favour with um, because we were we were a four piece band um, yeah. and we had we had the hits well we had Billy Don't Be a Hero and the Night Chicago Die and then management said I think you need a front man I think you need a, a guy up front who, who can sing and and Carlo was a he was a, a a solo artist, a local solo artist, who uh, he'd got quite a reputation. There's no two ways about that. Um, and he was, uh, but he was only in the band for about six months. Okay. He joined. He joined just after we'd released the Black Eyed Boys, which was the third single. And um, he left just before the release of um, Hitching a Ride. Did you know, okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. That was my next my next comment. The the old Vanity Fair track. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yes, they written, did by Mitch, written by Mitch Murray and Peter Callender. Right. An another one. Yeah, they, they were they were uh, you know really Lifting just. Writers. And I was I was going to say just pumping those the production on their end. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they yeah. wrote they wrote all the all the hits for Freddie and the Dreamers. They wrote all the hits, apart from a couple, for um, Jerry and the Pacemakers. Yeah, yeah. Um, they wrote a couple for Georgie Fame, a couple for the Tremolos, uh, uh, one for Cliff Richard. Hello, Sam. Goodbye, Samantha. They wrote that. Uh huh. Uh, they were they were multi millionaires when we met them. <laughs> Very prolific in yeah. their in their output. Wow, yeah. and they, they knew the the kind of catchy songs you know that would that would be popular too you know yeah they, were, they really had a knack knack for that yeah, yeah was, well uh so tell a story uh with billy don't be a hero uh how american group bo donaldson and the haywoods uh released it prior to you guys yeah what? they they pinched it okay <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, was, it, was, it was our first number one in the uk and we had every intention of recording it, of releasing it in, in the States. Uh, Mitch was in um, communication and, and sort of uh, having deal, trying to do a deal with Mercury. <clears throat> and um, he took a long time to do it. And while he was doing this deal, uh, Bo Donaldson was in a, I imagine in a garage somewhere rehearsing his band. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they got it out and yeah. it just shot to number one for him. Right, right. Well, I spoke, yeah. I spoke, I've spoken to him since. Uh -huh. I spoke to Bo Donaldson. I mean, he's a bit, uh -huh. of, a, he's a bit of an impresario now. He, he sort of uh, does this, that, and he's still, still uh, connected with entertainment. Uh-huh, yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> that was a, that was that was one of those cases of you snooze, you lose. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> right. But we've had there's been there's a couple of things on YouTube where uh, they compare the two, uh -huh, uh -huh. and we come out on top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I tell you, his 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 pipes are still strong too because yeah. I pick I picked up a best of. Well, it's it's called it's called no, it wasn't best of. It's called the whatever the album was that they they released with that song on it, and wow. I thought it was the original from back then, but it's. Wow. The, the newer Bo Donaldson, oh. but it sounds identical. I mean, it really yeah. it didn't it didn't sound any different. So, yeah, well, yeah, and your uh, again, your version topped the UK charts for like three weeks. So yeah, you yeah. did, nice did very, yeah. You did very well. Uh, then, uh, well, no, that was Billy. Don't be a hero. Uh, the the topping the charts for three weeks. On oh that. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, then came then came uh, the first paper lace song I ever heard, The Night Chicago Died. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it did very well in US and Canada. Yeah. And not not too bad domestically, not too bad back home. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> yeah, I think we got to I think it was three in the UK. But uh but in the States it just uh took everybody because everybody says, Oh, it's about Al Capone and uh, uh -huh. You know the Valentine's Day massacre, uh -huh. and the rest of it. Uh -huh. But really, when you, when you look into the lyrics, it's about a cop. Yeah, right. it's about a cop going out and coming back, surviving, if you like, having right. having gone through this this awful night. You know, uh -huh. um, and uh, and it, it it actually clicked with uh, with the uh, uh, first line um, emergency services in the states. Oh, okay, okay. With, with police and uh -huh. with fire firemen and all the rest of it, and uh -huh. and its popularity has sort of it's sort of stayed and bubbled under for a long time. It's it's one of those records that, that yeah. whenever you when you really hear it, I mean, I, I get quite a I get a performer's uh, loyalty, you know, like yeah, royalty. yeah, 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 uh -huh. uh, and and a big part of it comes from <clears throat> comes from a, a radio station in Manhattan. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. When yeah. I when I read down the things, it's 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 played in, you know, New York and around there. It's quite amazing. Yeah. I imagine that it gets uh regular airplay on stations and probably on the internet and yeah. that that kind of thing constantly still. Still very popular. Very we did, always we did get we did get slammed or or rather Peter Callender got slammed. Uh, for the uh, the lyric faux pas. <laughs> oh right, right. Uh, the, you want east to share side, the east, yeah. the east, yeah. the east side of Chicago. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. And we we were we we never we've never actually toured the states. Oh really? Okay. And you know, for a band to have a number one record and not yeah. tour the states is very unusual. Yes, it is. I mean, I I'm I'm trying to work things out now with a with a couple of people who who are big in the sort of nostalgia side of things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, oldy oldy sort of records and things like that, and to see whether there's any openings for for uh -huh. us to go over. But at the yeah. time, at the time, I mean, uh, unless you were a huge um, a huge act and very big internationally known. Uh, yeah. It was very difficult to tour outside of the UK because you had to have you had to have the support of your record company, mm -hmm. right? Because of you know the equipment and all the rest of it. I mean, nowadays it's a it's a foregone conclusion really that you you get a promoter, he provides that backline, front of house PA, everything else, the 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 crew to run it, and and it's all in the price if you like hotels. Yeah. International flights and all the rest of it. It's it's a very much a, a a sort of mechanism that just clicks into place. But in those days, it was really really difficult to 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 sort of get over there to do anything. Yeah, I can imagine. So yeah, I have had, I have heard stories too. We played a a seventies. It's a seventies weekender, and uh, we okay. were we were on on the Friday night. We opened it up, um, and it was at. Uh, I don't know where you you you're familiar with Butlins. 
holiday, holiday, the holiday camp. Okay, no, no, no. There's, there's three of them left. They used mm -hmm. to be fifty odd, but but now there's only three left. And there's, there's, only... there's one in Skegness, there's one in Minehead, and there's one in Bognor Regis. And oh, okay. we, we're playing all of them this year. Mm -hmm. um, we played Skegness last night. Um, to yeah, about, I mean, the hall holds about two and a half, three thousand people. Um, it's quite a big crowd, and they all right. they all dress up in what they think is his seventies. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, when I look at some of them, I thought I never saw anybody looking like you in the seventies <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> well, That's right. well, don't you have a show tomorrow? Tomorrow? Also? No, it's not tomorrow. We we oh, uh, it's okay. it's next weekend. Okay, next. Okay. We're in Minehead. A uh, similar thing. Similar. Okay. Well, that that well that sounds good. That sounds yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the uh, the album that followed um, and other bits of material. Yeah. Uh, I've got a copy on CD uh, off the repertoire re reissue that re repertoire reissue two thousand three. Um, I think my favorite track on the whole album. See if you remember this one, Mary in the Morning. All oh, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very, yeah, very pretty. People. Yeah, very pretty, pretty track. Like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and in fact, uh, I had posted that. I can send you, again, that link. You can yeah. maybe see some of the comments. But I had somebody, there's always those people out there that are looking to correct everybody. They're trolls or whatever you want to call them, you know. Yeah, it's like, yeah. this is wrong, this is wrong. And so somebody, some fan jumped on that and he said, it's not Mary in the morning, it's in the morning. Oh, <laughs> and I said, <laughs> and I looked back at it and you know, I had to check, maybe I did type it wrong. I said, no, they did have a song in the morning, but then they had a Mary in the morning. This is a different song, you know, yeah. you know. And in fact, you guys must have liked morning tracks <laughs> <laughs> because you had uh, you had those two, and then the other one from the first album, uh, "Mary in the Morning," "In the Morning," and "Early One Morning." So that's yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I tend to like those two. They're they're usually very pretty, you know, you know, kind of waking up and the sun's coming in, and if it's not raining. And, uh, you know, kind of really uh, eye-opening type songs, really, you know, usually, you know, my cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. On that as well. Well, yeah, that was the my pick from that one. Yeah. Um, and then um, let me ask you about Mary in the Morning. Um, was that a response, perhaps, to Billy Don't Be a Hero, like Billy and Mary are either <laughs> married or a couple? You know, they're both kind of anti -war. Not at all. I'm sorry. It's hard to burst the bubble. But, uh, <laughs> non -connect, no connection whatsoever. No connection there. Okay. <laughs> well, I won't, I, I'm, I'm not going to try to guess anymore, okay, <laughs> about, any, about any of these. That's that's two strikes, one more, and I'm out. So, <laughs> yeah, because I thought, you know, well, you know, it's singing about, you know, this one, Billy, you know, and then Mary, you know, in the in the vocals, and don't don't do this, don't go, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, well, maybe, okay, scratch that. Well, um, moving ahead, uh, nineteen seventy eight, yeah. under a slight slightly different lineup. Yeah. Uh, the band came out with a sing along version of "We've Got the Whole Wide World in Our Hands." Yeah. Uh, singing with the Nottingham Forest Football Club. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That, must well, that, have was the, that was the that was the same lineup uh, uh -huh. as, the, as the, the Billy Don't Be a Hero band. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Lineup. Our our sort of popularity was waning a little bit, and and Forest were winning everything that uh, <laughs> they put before them. They they just they were an amazing football team at uh -huh. that, that period. Yeah, they're not, yeah. So, they're not so good now, but, uh, <laughs> but they. Uh, and because they uh, they used to say that um, this the, the record we got the whole we got the best team in the land and that's that's the lyrical change. Um, they uh, used to play it whenever Forest won, and I think uh, the reason why it, it waned in popularity is because they weren't winning, so they didn't. Play. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, 
It was quite amazing. Well, you can place the all the blame on the football team then, you know, for your for your wane in popularity. <laughs> uh, well, I can I can vaguely remember it was the same song as Laurie London's, right? That's right. He's got, yeah. the, whole, he's got the whole world in his hand. I yeah. I can I can remember that that track. Yeah, he was he was very young when he recorded that. Yeah, he's he's yeah. Uh, he's disappeared off the face of the earth, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no trace of him at all. He's yeah. really difficult. Yeah, Just that to, one, that one hit, and yeah, and then that was it. And yeah, yeah. There are there are people like that. Maybe they don't want to be found. Maybe, uh, maybe yeah. yeah, you never know. Well, so um, the band uh, packed it in originally in what nineteen eighty four. Yeah, eighty four, eighty five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just basically what you said. You know, your popularity had had diminished, and uh, you weren't putting out the the hit yeah. records. And the usual excuse is the musical differences. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Right. So there was a bit of that as well. Okay, okay. Well, we'd you'd been. We'd all got different ideas, and I, I longed for a, a bit of stability. In actual yeah. fact, I've got my kids and all the rest of it. Um, yeah. And I just wanted some, but so I, I got a proper job. I okay. Went, I went into the building industry, and uh, and then I, 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 I fronted a, a band, a local band. Um, called Sons and Lovers. Okay. Um, and uh, up front of that, we used to do Billy Abbey here. We used to know Chicago died, and uh, but I'd be out front singing it. And um, yeah, it was it was okay for a few years, and then, uh, uh, like you said earlier, that uh, I got I was still in touch with Cliff, so and we decided to put it put the, the band together again. Okay. Well, going back, I wanted to mention one thing um, again with the song "Billy, Don't Be a Hero." Yeah. Before we yeah. moved on, about 1990, yeah, yeah. Uh, circa the Gulf War, yeah. it was banned. You guys record uh, re-recorded it, you, Chris, and Mick, and banned yeah. by the banned by the BBC. Yeah, that's wow. right. Yeah, yeah, too anti-war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, well, the thing was that they they banned anything that mentioned war or you know any connotations towards shooting or killing or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was banned, and um, in actual fact, it, they may have done us a favour because uh, what we didn't realise is the last thing that people wanted to hear was mm -hmm. a rehash of an original hit. You know, yeah. it's all right re-releasing that hit, but yeah. but not re re. And we we did a, a well. It was Mick Vaughan's uh, brainchild, if you like, and he was he tended to be uh, he was a, he, he fancied himself as a, a record producer. He is a very good record producer now, <laughs> but um, but in those days it was everything and the kitchen sink. In this okay. record, uh -huh. and it was it was quite. I don't, I don't know where have you you. Have you heard it? No, I haven't heard that version. No, it's it, there is, it. it is on YouTube. Uh -huh. uh, it's the uh, it, it, there's a video um, okay. that that is a it's got a marching band in it and all the rest of it and some shooting. We we took over uh, to publicise it. We took over a, 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 an adventure park uh, oh, okay. local to Nottingham called the American Adventure. Oh, okay. It's got it's got the Alamo in it, and it's got one and two, and <laughs> and the rest of it. And we took over this uh, this park for a couple of days, and uh, the staff were were quite willing to sort of um, appear in it all. So they got soldiers, and they were all oh. dressed properly, and it was it was quite a, a good video. But um, but it, and it ends with. Uh, his fiance walking down the street and this paper that she threw away sort of fluttering down the down the street yeah. the main street <laughs> uh, i'll have to check that out i will have yeah, to look it's, it's quite funny <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like everyone enjoyed doing that yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was <laughs> and actually but mitch murray actually appears in it oh he, he okay. sits in he sits in the he came he came down and he sits in the saloon where uh -huh. where the one of the, a bit of the action takes place, and he's sitting there, and he's play. I think he's playing cards. <laughs> he pulled it. He pulled an Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, 
He did, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, um, so you enjoyed your, now getting back to where we were, you did enjoy your time with Sons and Lovers? You, you did yeah, yeah, it. It, was, it was good. It was it was nice. Um, I, I should have, in actual fact, I should have stopped working with them earlier and, and reformed Paper Lace earlier. But... Uh, yeah. Hindsight's a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> right, right. It it is. It is. Well, uh, you uh, did did say you mentioned two thousand nine, and who who contacted who first? You or Cliff? About I, I, went, I, went, I just went to see Cliff, and okay. uh, he was he was actually at that point he was he was running a, a like a he got a small supermarket in in his uh, in his village. <laughs> Uh, and he owned that and lived above, and uh, he was working, and I got in the queue. <laughs> ah, okay. And he didn't, and he didn't recognize me. <laughs> he, he didn't, really. <laughs> he went, crikey, you know. <laughs> because we, had, we, hadn't, uh, we hadn't seen each other for about a year, and uh -huh. uh, it was just, uh, well, we talked, but we would not really met face to face. Face to face. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so you and every, you both changed too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the latest album, uh, it's worth it. Yeah, all right. Yes. Yeah, is is on Bandcamp. Yeah. yeah, is that right? Okay, it and is. Uh, and it's it's a re-recording of the and other bits of material. Is that right? Uh, not completely. Not completely. Uh, okay. But it's but it's got a lot of. Uh, a lot of the uh, album material on there, mm -hmm. plus the title track of uh, "It's Worth It" that we that we wrote. I wrote with Dave Major. Oh, okay, okay. And it's it's a story of the band, basically. Gotcha, gotcha. People can check it out there on on Bandcamp and yeah, as well. Uh, well, how what has been the uh, responses so far to to that? It's worth it. It's been it's been pretty good. I mean, we took it uh, when we went to Australia in uh, uh, May twenty three. Uh, we we went over there and we took the took the album with us, and it sold. We sold at gigs, you know, lots of uh, lots of copies. Um, it's on Bandcamp, as I say, and Bandcamp doesn't done very well. Uh, I mean, you to, to, it's to get a national release and radio play is very very difficult. Especially yeah. when you're you're coming up from the back, you know. Right. Oh, definitely. Yes. Well, I forgot to ask you. Uh, looking back on um, some of the live shows and gigs that you played during your heyday, during the yeah uh, the seventy seventy four, uh, any any particular ones that stand out, or any that you uh, e either acts that you supported or that you played alongside. Well, the, the, the big, I suppose the big thing, the memorable things, were were the top of the pops appearances. Ah, uh, okay. Right. And meeting meeting different people on there, uh, people because it it was a, it was a strange <laughs> it was a strange business in in the, the early seventies when you were uh, appeared on top of the pops because you were all completely equal. You've made it. You've got on. Yeah. The, you've got a record yeah. out. It was doing well. So everybody that appeared on there. And uh, what sticks in my mind is our first our first appearance on Top of the Pops was on in February the it was February the twenty third. Um, wow. um, I remember it because this this is the fifty year thing. Um, <laughs> uh, in February the twenty third, nineteen seventy four, and Queen were on the same bill. And they 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 just released Seven Seas Arrive. That's right. Yeah, just 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 past the anniversary, like you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. And, and later on, I uh, we had a guy, we had a guy for a time. Um, uh, before before that, we parted company in eighty four. There was a there was a band change. Two two people left. Chris mm -hmm. Morris and Mike Vaughan left. And we got uh, two other guys in. Uh, one of them was Peter Oliver from, uh, he used to be with the New Seekers. Yes, yes. And another guy was Jamie Moses. And uh, he played with in the Brian May Band. Oh, and, he, okay. and he also appeared with uh, 
He also appears in We Are the Champions uh, DVD of Queen. Oh, uh, does he? Yeah, and he was the, well. He's the, he was the second guitarist with Brian May, oh. and um, they they were booked. Brian, well, Queen and Paul Rogers uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, did a tour, and they yeah. were due, they were due to um, they were due to actually play in Nottingham because uh, we we have a, a ten thousand seater arena in Nottingham, uh, uh -huh. and. Um, and my wife had bought me tickets to see, because she knew that Jamie was in the band. <laughs> she bought me tickets to uh, about a year before for, as a birthday present. Uh, but about a month before the concert, uh, the ticket company went bust. Mm. And, uh, and we, we we took steps and we got our money back. But I rang Jamie up and I said, uh, Look, I said, I wanted to see you. I wanted to see you with the uh, with Queen Paul Rogers. Uh, I said the money's not a, a problem. I said, but uh, it's it's a sellout. And he said, oh, don't worry, I'll put you on the guest list. So he put me on put me on the guest <laughs> list. We went, and he introduced me to Brian May. Exactly. And, <laughs> and I said, I said to I said to Brian May, um, actually, this isn't the first time I met you. I met you in '74. When you did Seven Seas of Rye, and, uh, and I said, "Because we were we were all on that program. There was there was Paper Lace, Shawadi Wadi, the Wombles." And he uh, said, oh, I'm beginning to remember it. <laughs> he doesn't want to go there. <laughs> yeah, what a lovely man! It's terrific. Yeah. Yeah, terrific I, guy. I was I was going to ask you about him. To me, he seems uh, pretty almost reticent, shy. Is he? Is he? he is, kind yeah. of. Yeah, he seems he seems that way. Yeah. Very humble, very feel right. the ground, you know, right, right? right. And because you know, whenever you see him talking, it, it's very uh, he's very studious. He's he's um, he thinks about what he says, and it it's always you know the right thing. Right, right. And I wish yeah. I mean him and uh, Roger, are, 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 you know, they've done they've done marvelous in keeping. I mean, Queen are a, a British institution. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Yeah, uh, yeah. I thought when Paul Rogers uh, joined, I thought, how can you replace Freddie? Freddie, you know, it's but they, it did, really... they didn't replace. They didn't replace him. He, yeah, he was just. He was so. I mean, he was very. They were very careful in what they did. Yeah, yeah. And they used to, in the in the actual live performance. They have a a, a projection of Freddie playing Bohemian Rhapsody or part of it, mm -hmm. uh, and. and um they they just worked that into the act and it was like having Freddie there. It was oh, okay. quite His spirit was, yeah. His spirit was really, yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow. Well yeah, I loved uh, early Queen, like 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 yeah. you said. Yeah. yeah. Sheer, sheer heart attack and yeah, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah. I mean their later uh, their whole career is is great. You know, yeah, all their all their material. Faultless. Well <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well uh uh, I was going to ask you, okay, to talk about a little bit about the current, uh, the band, yeah, and uh, touring. You recently New Zealand and Australia to sold out shows, yeah, uh, really popular there. Really, really go down well there. Well, we got a go we, we we got a gold album from Australia. The it's uh, all of its material went gold. Yeah, yeah, wow. I'm a Night Chicago died in the States, went uh, platinum. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was, I've still got several sort of discs and things which are hanging on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> right. They look uh, good on the wall. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you, you, you'll have to try to come over, um, you know, and see if, see if you can't work something out. Yeah, that's um, right. Okay. Well, um, how about uh, the upcoming shows? Well, you mentioned you played yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, are you staying pretty pretty busy with with those over there in the UK? Yeah, it, it's difficult. It's difficult because of the uh, you know the financial crisis that everybody's in. Um, yeah. Because it's entertainment isn't sort of a, a priority, really. Uh, especially going out to see when you can turn the TV on and watch somebody and YouTube and all the rest of it. You can see that. So. So it is difficult, and and since um, since COVID, I mean that was that was when we sort of 
we didn't work, we didn't do a thing for two years. And um, that was when the, the, the It's Worth It was recorded, basically. Yeah. Right. Um, Dave Major, he went, he went back, he's got an MA in uh, record production. Oh, okay. He went back to university and he got that. And part of his, part of his schedule was to record a band. Uh, and they got the up to minute studios the university had. And uh, he said, would, the, would the rest of Paper Lace come in and uh, I'll record, I'll, we'll record you, you know? And I said, uh, yeah, fantastic, free studio time. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we, got, we got a lot of the tracks done there and then they were passed around different because we all, we've all got sort of logic on Mac and all the rest of it. So you can, you can mess around and, and do the recordings. Um, yeah. if, when you, once you've got the basic track down and that's, that's how it all came about really. Uh, and then we dedicated it to, uh, to Cliff because yeah. he was the bass player on it. Right. And he passed away la last year, right? Last yeah, year. that's right. It was yeah. such a oh well. The 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 when we went to Australia, um, a lot of the Australians thought that we'd cancel the tour because he couldn't make it. But we we sat around, and spoke about it, and we said, I think. Well, I thought I said the last thing that Cliff would want is to, for us to cancel the tour. You know, he he wanted to go out there and and show the Australians what we can do and all the rest of it because they. We we went out there in seventy five. Uh, we went again in two thousand seventeen mm -hmm. because they just had to have us back. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, <laughs> and then we went again last year. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he his funeral, in actual fact, was uh, was two weeks before we left for Australia. Oh, okay. So it was still fresh on everybody's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was really sad. But he got, we, we mentioned the fact, I mean, people had seen it because it was in all the national papers. And um, we, we'd made it quite plain about Cliff and uh, how sad it was all. And uh, he got a round of applause at every gig. Great. I mentioned, you know, the, the, the crowd were. The audiences in Australia are very attentive. They want to know about your what you do, you know, what you had for breakfast. It was that sort of, <laughs> that sort of thing. They want to know everything about you. And um, it was easy to talk to the, the crowds mm. and, and tell them all about Cliff and what he'd done. And, you know, I mean, we, yeah. And it was, it, was, it was very pleasant, that side yeah. of things. Right. They personalize it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. Yeah. Well, going back, I'm sorry I'm retracting here and going back, mm -hmm. uh, but a couple of things I forgot to ask you about. The Night Chicago Died. Yeah. Uh, when that came out, did you uh, did you have any any fans or people that heard the song thought you were American? Yeah. I mean, they were <laughs> really surprised. that we Yeah. Were... yeah I was... did. I did when I first heard it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Strange. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. I mean, yeah, the world does exist outside of America, you know. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. I think we've learned yeah. that as as the decades yeah. have come progressed. And who outfitted the band in those suits for the, oh. the promo shots again? Yeah, well, yeah. that was that. It got to become a thing. Well, it it kicked off with Billy Don't Be a Hero because we, ah. we were all dressed up in the uh, uh, the Union sort of uh, yeah. yeah. Civil War, yeah, stuff, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and Mitch Murray was a big big fan of that. I mean, we did a we did a, a, a shot uh, around a campfire with guns and all the rest of it <laughs> on Hampstead Heath, with wow. and Mitch Murray's in the background. <laughs> he was just he's just a, such a funny guy, and he wanted to he wanted he got a Rolls Royce, he got a yellow Corniche at the time. Uh, and it, yeah. It, and he said, I wanted to put a tow bar on and tow a cannon up to Hampstead <laughs> Heath. But he thought better of it. And, uh, we, just, we just made do with the guns and the, all the rest of it. And then and then when uh, the Night Chicago died, when, when that came about, he said, uh, we're going to carry on this theme of you dressing to, to, to match the, the part. And I said, well, what are you going to do? And he says, well, we're going to dress you up in... in uh, gangster mobster suits you know sort of uh, pinstripe suit <laughs> yeah and so that's how that came about i mean uh, we we took some 
we took some pictures uh, very close to a prison that's in uh, Winston Green in Birmingham. And somebody saw us with these machine guns and in dressed up in these pinstripes. <laughs> and they called the police. Did they really? <laughs> and the police came up and they arrested us. They took us off. <laughs> <laughs> they took us off to the police station and uh, there was a lot of explanation. The manager came and he, he said, look, this is it's obvious, you know, how would anybody, you know, just some, some idiot has sort of seen these uh, four gangsters with machine guns. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, so, and it was it was very funny, and it, but it turned into a quite a bit of uh, great publicity. I was going to say, you know, exactly. And even the the publicity or the the BBC banning the re-release of uh, any any publicity is good publicity so yeah of course you know you know so they don't inadvertently it helps you you know yeah that's right yeah so, so yeah so yeah well uh, any any plans to record more material yeah i think uh, well but in actual fact phil hendrix is a quite a prolific writer he's got uh, he's got one or two things on on bandcamp um, a couple of albums. He's just really good, and he writes great seventies material. He's, yeah. he's he's really good. And uh, Dave is the expert uh, mixer master, and um, he does the mastering and uh, and finishes the the things off. Um, so yeah, I think I think the view is that uh, we will record some more stuff. I think we've ta we've taken the uh, other bits of material to the to the nth degree. We've re-recorded them. I can send you I can send you the MP3s if you like. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. Let me know your Let me know your email, and okay. I'll, I, I can send you the, the MP3s of the uh, the album. Yeah. And, um, anything else in uh, closing you'd like to plug or talk about or? Not really. No. No. I think um, you know things are things are going okay. Um, uh, we're all getting uh, a little older. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm thankful that I can still do what I do. Um, last night sort of proved it again. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, and and still playing live and enjoying it, and like you said, New Zealand, Australia. Any uh, plans to play any other uh, countries? Well, we'd yeah. like to. I mean, I am in negotiation with a, a couple of a couple of three people about the states, um, okay. but it, but it's such a big place, and yeah. uh, and and the cost of everything is is just through the roof, uh, and yeah. there are other priorities, you know, that, than than actually traveling and to to, to perform over there. I mean, we'd yeah. love, to, and and there's lots of requests. I mean, I get, I probably get. Uh, well, you've only got to look at the hits on the um, on the on the YouTube stuff. You know, Billy right. Ramiro and Night Chicago died. It still gets a lot of interest oh, yeah. on oh, YouTube, yeah. and oh, yeah. and I get I get probably three, four, five emails uh, a week. You know, from from guys in the states. You know, when are you coming over to so and so? When are you going to? You know, and it's, you think crikey, yeah, that'll be. <laughs> <awesome. laughs> yeah, you see, can you put me up? Can you? Uh... <laughs> You know, can I stay at your house? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Well, Philip, I appreciate it. Um, you're real easy to talk to. Uh, oh, thank you're, you. you're kind of an easygoing guy, I can tell. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I've enjoyed it. Thanks to you for, you know, anecdotes and all the stories, uh, recalling all those and uh, sharing so much. And uh, I will, I will give you my email. Yeah. And then uh, send you the link to the, my other channel, so you can check out check out some of the stuff on there. Yeah, and um, and we'll be uh, let's keep in touch. Yeah, do that, and and thank thank all the fans that we've got in the states. You know, thanks for buying the record. Thanks for making us number one. There you go. Uh, there we'll you be go. Back in the day, <laughs> that's right. There's yeah. still good music is going to travel anyway. Of so course. yeah, it does. So it's it's there for po posterity, definitely. Yeah. So, all right, and I'll send you a link to this once I get it edited a yeah, little bit. Yeah, I'll put it on and the page. Yeah. There you go. There you go. All right, again, thank you, Philip, and uh, you. 
You have a good rest of the weekend, okay? Thank you. All right. Cheers, Greg.